Thank you. So a very good morning. Uh, my name is Wei Ming. So I, I, I'm, I come from a very warm country, Singapore. So uh, before we get started, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you are actually not familiar with beacons? Uh, that is something new to you. Um, how, how about the rest? Have you played with beacons? Um, beacons? Not bacon, beacons. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm super excited to, to, to be here today. Uh, for the next 45 minutes, uh, I'm going to talk to you about beacons. So uh, basically, I am excited with anything that is wireless, that has got no wires. So, okay, so let me tell you the agenda for the next 45 minutes. Uh, hopefully, we have time to finish everything. So I'm going to talk to you about what are beacons. Um, uh, one thing to clarify, my talk today is going to be cross-platform. It means that it runs on iPhones, it runs on Android. Um, I'm not too sure about Windows Phone. But, but who cares about Windows Phone anyway, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the different types of beacons and how to detect beacons in iOS as well as Android. Now, uh, if you want to follow along, you can download and install the following two applications. Um, Estimode. By the way, I, I'm not affiliated with Estimode. It's just that I'm a big fan of their devices, and I, I like to use their SDK to, to do development work for beacons. So uh, this is one application that you might want to download. And the second application, Light Blue, is an application that allows you to scan for Bluetooth low-energy devices that are around you. Right? So for example, you can use that application to scan for people with heart transplant devices in their heart. You can connect to the device and stop the device. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. So uh, you, you can't really do that. But. Now, uh, let's talk about location-based services. Now, today, uh, as a mobile developer, uh, I'm, I'm really sure that you, you, you are no stranger to location-based services applications. So uh, the ability to get your location, your latitude, lat lat latitude, longitude, it's of interest to a lot of people, including users. So, but the problem is that when you are indoor, getting simply the latitude and longitude of your location is not enough. So you want to know whether you are near a particular store when you're indoor. For example, you are in a shopping mall. So when you are in the shopping mall, you would like to know whether you are near a particular store like Nike store or whether you are in a particular department in a departmental store. So as you travel around indoor, you want to know um, where exactly you are. And simply knowing your latitude and longitude is not going to be really helpful. And hence, we need micro-location technology. And the answer is in the form of beacons. So um, at this moment, there are two main types of beacons. Uh, Apple has got the iBeacon. Apple is the one who pioneered the, the so-called beacon technology. And then shortly after, Google says that, hey, you, Apple has got something. We need to have something as well. And it, it calls its uh, uh, beacon technology Eddystone. Why do they call this Eddystone? OK. Yeah, I'll tell you later. So all those who get it right, I'll throw you a beacon. So. OK, so according to Wikipedia, uh, beacons are basically a class of Bluetooth low energy devices that broadcast their identifiers to nearby portable electronic devices. So um, if, you, if you download the Estimode beacons, uh, Estimode application, uh, you would not be surprised to see that there are actually a lot of beacons uh, around you. Now, before we talk about beacons, we need to understand the Bluetooth technologies that are in use today. So today, there are two main types of uh, Bluetooth technologies. The classic Bluetooth, which everybody is very, very familiar with. Uh, this is the classic Bluetooth that allows you to have streaming audio uh, to, your, to your earpiece. And more recently, we have what we call Bluetooth Low Energy, BLE. So BLE is actually designed for occasional exchange of small data. And it, it's basically very similar to your classic Bluetooth, it operates in the 2.4 gigahertz uh, band, except that the connection is really fast, and it takes very little amount of energy. And the range is more than 100 meters as compared to your classic Bluetooth. Now, in order to su uh, support beacons in your applications, there are 
uh, some criteria that your devices need to fulfill. So if you are on the iPhone, I, I think as far as iOS is concerned, uh, you should be pretty safe. Uh, starting from iPhone 4S and above, uh, Apple already supports BLE. Uh, how many of you are still using iPhone 4? One? iPhone 3GS? Okay, I'm not going to talk to you, talk to you about that. <laughs> Who is using Windows Phone? Okay. Now, Bluetooth LE. Now, um, Google has been a little bit late to support Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, because Google was betting its farm on another technology. What was that? Before Google supports uh, BLE, Google was really heavily invested in one more technology known as NFC. What does NFC stand for? Wrong. It's nobody freaking cares. <laughs> now, let me ask you, honestly, all those Android users in this room, how many of you actually use NFC on a daily basis? No. No, I, I can't see this thing. So. <laughs> right? So most of you, how many Android users are there in this room? Let's have a show of hands. Okay, I think it's about maybe 60% of the, the, the room. Okay, so how many of you use NFC? No. So, uh, and today, NFC is not really a, a, a big thing. It's because every... Vendors are waiting for this particular fruit company. What fruit company is that? Apple. And then when they released iPhone 6, everybody was so excited, hey, NFC is coming to iPhone. But Apple says, sorry, we're not going to expose the APIs to you. We only, only want to use it for our Apple Pay. Yes. So, so <laughs> uh, there's NFC there. Yeah. But that's not a... Yes, it's only for Apple Pay, yeah. but not for third-party developers. Okay. okay? So I, I don't think in my, at least in my lifetime, I'm, I'm going to see NFC support for third-party developers on an iOS platform. Now, here are the, some of the Bluetooth low energy devices available in the market. Uh, I am very sure you are familiar with some of them. Uh, how many of you have an Apple Watch? Okay, quite a promising number. Uh, how about the, the one in center? Okay, this is what we call the TI sensor tech. So it's basically a, a, a small little device that supports Bluetooth low energy, and it, it, it has got built-in sensors. The one that I show, uh, I've shown on the slide here has got 10 built-in sensors. Uh, it allows you to know the temperature, the barometric, barometric, uh, it has got barometric uh, sensors, uh, compass, gyroscope, so on and so forth, and you can actually write applications to talk to this device to actually pull data out from this device. And it has got two buttons where you can actually program and you can write a selfie application so that your phone is paired with this device and then you can press a button to take selfie. Okay? So, are you impressed? Uh, Fitbit. Fitbit. Fitbit allows you to measure your, 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 your steps. So, uh, heart rate sensor, your, your, the, the first smartwatch in the market, Pebble. What other Bluetooth devices are there out in the market? There are many, many innovative devices. This is one of them. Uh, no, I, I, I'm serious. I, I got this from the web. Uh, this is a pacifier. Those of you who have got children, you know that pacifier is the greatest invention on Earth. Uh, agree? No? And, and this, this pacifier has got this ability to measure the temperature of the, the, the child. Um, and... and in, in, in my presentation earlier on at the IOT conference uh, in, in Oslo earlier this year, I, I jokingly said that uh, I'm working on a secret project so that I have a button here so that when I press a button here, I will make the baby go to sleep. <laughs> and after the session, you know, somebody came up and said, are you sure you're really making this? <laughs> I said, um, well... Only in Singapore. <laughs> so, uh, next thing. What is this? It basically allows you to measure the, your biting strength. Um, I, I, I don't know how useful this is, but never mind. Okay, so let's talk about beacon devices. Now, today, there are many ways to actually create beacons. 
So the simplest way and the maybe the cheapest way is to buy it from a beacon manufacturer. So uh, my, my personal favorite is this uh, beacon from Estimote. So it looks like this with a rubble casing. So if you use your pen knife to cut out the casing, you'll be able to see a circuit board with a battery. And it looks like this. And this beacon basically broadcast Bluetooth low energy devices continuously so that you can actually write apps to detect the presence of this beacon. Now, um, since we are on this, there are other ways to create beacons. Uh, how many of you are, are actually playing with Arduinos? Anybody? So if you have an Arduino, you can buy the Arduino 101 uh, by Intel. It has got built-in Bluetooth low energy. It can write a very simple script, run on it, and it can broadcast Eddystone beacons. Okay, we'll talk about Eddystone beacons uh, in a moment. So this is how beacons work. So beacons work by transmitting uh, Bluetooth low energy packets continuously. And you, as the developer, basically write your apps. Uh, it works on uh, Android as well, even though I show an iPhone here. And, and basically, you detect for the signals emitted by each beacon. And as you travel, as you get near this beacon, uh, you, you, you receive the signal from this beacon, and you know that, OK, I'm, I'm near this beacon, and I should be at a particular location. So this is how beacons work, really, really simple. Now, before we talk about beacons, let's have a recap of how location-based services work today. Now, those of you who are developing apps, you know that in, in iOS, you make use of the core location framework, and in, in Android, you use the location manager to get your location. But internally, how does it work? Now, let me get start off by saying that, first of all, it can make use of GPS, right? I think GPS is something that everybody is very familiar with. What else besides GPS? What other techniques does it use to get your location? Assisted GPS, Assisted GPS or, or sometimes we, we call this cellular network, OK? And then Wi-Fi. Wi what else? What else? Are these three the only ways you can get the location? Bluetooth. But how does Bluetooth help you in getting your location? Um, have you ever seen this? Those, those of you on, on the iPhone, when you turn off Bluetooth, it says location accuracy and nearby services are improved when Bluetooth is turned on. How does it work? How does it work? I'm going to tell you the answer. So first of all, GPS. So I think GPS needs no introduction. So you have a lot of satellites or orbiting around the Earth, and your device is able to get signal. But the only thing is that you need to be indoor. Oh, but, sorry, sorry. You need to be outdoor, right? So if you are indoor, it will not be able to work. Now, cellular network. So cellular network works by your phone getting signals from the cell tower. Every cell tower has got a cell ID. And when your device gets the cell ID, as well as the signal strength from the cell tower, it basically transmits to either Apple or Google. And they have a huge database containing the locations of each cell tower. And by triangulation, they, are, they will be able to get your, your location pretty accurately. How about Wi-Fi, before I show that slide? How does, uh, I, I always like to ask people, um, how does Wi-Fi help you to get your location? And people always tell me, IP address. It's, it's not true, right? IP address? Nope. Nope. Why? Because if you go to your home network, I, I bet your IP address is 192.168.1 point some numbers, right? So. The location of the Wi Fi hotspots. Yes. The MAC address. The MAC address, very good. So it works by having the MAC address of the wireless routers. So, same thing, um, Apple and Google, they have their own databases containing the address of all the wireless routers around the world. Now, who actually collects, how do they actually collect all this information? It's thanks to you and I. Our phones are continuously transmitting all this data to, to Apple, to Google. Now, here's one interesting, example, uh, interesting experiment that you can, you can do. Now, today, go home. Before you travel, if you're traveling, uh, unplug your wireless router from your, from your home network, unplug it, put it into your luggage, and when you arrive at your destination country, plug it back in, and straight away launch your app. 
make sure you're indoor, make sure you turn off the cellular network, you only on Wi-Fi, your location application will still tell you that you're still back in your home. Okay, and then you wait a while, and then try again, and they will tell you that now you are in the correct country. Okay? Now, what about Bluetooth? Now, Apple has got this long-term vision that um, everywhere in this world are full of beacons. So beacons has got what we call unique uh, identifier, UUID. So they, they call this proximity UUID. So just very much like your MAC address as well as your cell ID for your cell tower and your routers, they have a database containing the address of all the beacons as well as the locations. So this is how it helps to um, improve the, the location information of your um, application, of, of a device. So what are the users of beacons? So um, at least in, in Singapore, we, we have a lot of projects uh, involving museums. So in the museums, you have beacons planted everywhere. So you have an application developed by this museum. So as you are looking at the exhibits, uh, the application knows where you are located, and it will automatically display the information of uh, the, the various exhibits that you're looking at. Uh, you can also do that for warehouse items tracking. You can do that for access authorization. Uh, something interesting about warehouse items tracking, this applies to your home network as well. So uh, imagine you have a Raspberry Pi. So that's a very super cheap computer, and you can write a script to scan for beacons. And you buy all those beacons and give it to your child, give it to your wife, give it to your husband. So anytime the, 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 your, your children get home, the Raspberry Pi would be able to detect the beacon and it would automatically send a message to, to you and say, okay, your children is back home. Or if your children has uh, left the house, your Raspberry Pi can automatically detect that and then send you a push notification. Okay? So, do, do, you, do you actively track where your kids are? <laughs> Sorry, wrong audience. Uh, we, we, we do that in Singapore. Maybe it's a cultural difference, but... <laughs> okay, um, advertisements. So, uh, this is very useful. For example, um, uh, your, your company, your, or, or in, in a big exhibition, when somebody goes to your booth, uh, you want to um, tell your audience about your, the great products that the company is selling. So, you can actually pick, take a beacon, put it under the table, and then the, the users would be able to automatically see that whenever uh, he comes near your booth. I'll talk about that uh, in, in a while. Google has got this project known as the physical web, which allows your device to automatically tell you that you are near a beacon. Okay, let's talk about iBeacon first. So iBeacon, first of all, is a trademark of Apple. So whenever you talk about iBeacon, you're talking about Apple's implementation of beacons. So in the US, um, in all their Apple stores, they have beacons embedded in, in, in the, under the table. Something interesting about Apple stores is that they, they hide their equipments really, really well. Can you find where are their cash registers? Have you, have you ever shopped in an Apple store in the US? So if you pay cash, where do they keep the cash? It's actually hidden under the table. So now you know. <laughs> and where, where do they print the receipt? The printers are embedded inside the table. So it's very strange. Also when you pay for something, they say, hang on get the receipt from under the table. So, so in the US, they have uh, beacons in the Apple Store, and, and everywhere you go, the, the Apple Store application will tell you, okay, now you're looking at iMacs, now you're looking at a very expensive MacBook Pros. Anybody ordered the new MacBook Pros? No. Okay, no Apple fans in this, in this room. Now, let's talk about iBeacons in more details. Now, basically, iBeacons transmits a Bluetooth low energy advertisement every second. And the kind of things that it transmits is very, very limited. So it basically transmits a 20 bytes data. So the first 16 bytes is what we call your proximity UUID. And the next two bytes is your major, and your next two bytes is your minor. So why is this useful? 
before we talk about that. Now, imagine that you are a um, departmental store like Macy's in, in the US. So Macy's has got a lot of branches all over the states. So if Macy's would be to, would be to, to implement beacons, so all the beacons that Macy's purchase would have this proximity UUID. Now, this is a long string of characters that is so-called unique to one vendor, but it is important to clarify at this moment, there is no central body governing the use of proximity UUID, meaning if Macy's would to, would, would to use this UUID, I can create a beacon with this proximity UUID. I can do that if I want to. So for all the, for the store, for all the beacons that you use, the, in, in the beacon, uh, Macy's store at, let's say, Las Vegas, you have a major one. All the beacons that you use in San Francisco, for example, would have major two. And within the store in Las Vegas, the beacons that you have in the shoes department may have minor one. All the beacons that you use in the men's department may have minor two. So collectively, these three pieces of information allows you to identify that this beacon belongs to a particular company. This, may, uh, this beacon is actually in a particular store, is in a particular department. So what's the range of eye beacons? Uh, standard range is 70 meters, and the farthest that you, you, you can go is 450 meters, but it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the location, the placements, the uh, obstructions, as well as the power transmission of the, the uh, beacon. So, now, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Bluetooth low energy devices, uh, Bluetooth low energy devices basically has got two phases. The first phase is advertising to let people know that you are around. And the second part is how do you actually connect to that device to configure that device. But for beacons, for iBeacons, uh, the main task of iBeacons is to advertise. So it keeps on advertising itself. Now, how to program iBeacons? So, so basically, there are two ways to program, uh, two stages to program iBeacons. The first is what we call monitoring a region. So you want to monitor whether your device has entered a particular region defined by beacons. So once you enter the region, you would do what we call ranging for beacons. So you would find, once I'm in this region, what are the beacons that are near me? So as I, as I travel, I will keep on getting information about the beacons that are nearest to me. So I, I would be able to know um, which section I, I am in a department store, for example. So now this part involves uh, iBeacon advertisement. So uh, I'm going to skip over this very quickly. So basically, uh, this is how it looks like if you were to, to configure a beacon and if you were to analyze the packets that are being emitted by this beacon. So it looks something like this. Not really ter terribly Im important to you at this moment. Now, so how do you actually um, look for beacons in iOS? So right out of the box, iBeacons uh, is supported in the CL Location Manager. So you create a CL beacon region, start monitor for it, and then once you enter that particular region, you can range for beacons. So in Android, there are many ways to look out for beacons. You can use the Google Nearby Messages API, or if you are using beacons manufactured by some providers, you can, they have their own SDK, or in general, you can use the Estimode SDK for Android. So, let me show you a demo before I, I show you a demo. Now, for developers, how do you actually um, create beacons so that you can actually use it for your development stage? So there are a few ways to create beacons. Uh, the cheapest way to create beacons uh, is not buying beacons. Basically, download the Estimode app that I told you earlier on. On the iOS, you can actually configure this to act as a beacon. So let me show you a demo. So I have a device here, and I'm going to launch the Estimode application. And this is how the Estimode application looks like. And at the bottom right, you have a devices. Tap on devices, and I will be able to scan for beacons. OK, so I, I, I see a virtual beacon somewhere. 
Can you see that? Who, who, who is running a beacon now? Okay, cool. Let me connect to your phone and then remove, uh, delete everything. So, no. <laughs> okay, now, um, you can also act as a beacon. So, on the right hand side, right bottom side, virtual beacon. Oh, that's one more, that's one more. Oh, oh okay, it's coming up. And I can act as a beacon as well. So, when I, when I tap on this, I am now a very expensive beacon. <laughs> okay, so... Now, or if you are a Raspberry Pi user, uh, especially as a Raspberry Pi 3, Raspberry Pi 3 has got built-in Bluetooth low energy, you can actually write a very simple script to broadcast as an iBeacon. Or if you want, you can buy the Estimote beacons. So there are many Estimote beacons that you, you can, you can um, buy today. And some of them are able to broadcast simultaneously as an iBeacon as well as an Eddy Stone. Okay, so if you're interested, go and check out their website. Now, I'm going to show you a demo of how I can programmatically find the uh, beacons that I have. So this is my setup. So I have two Estimote beacons with me right now with the batteries removed to simulate that I am outside that, that region. And I also have an Android device. Now, interestingly, if you download the Estimote application on Android, when you act as a beacon, it broadcasts as an Eddy Stone beacon. Okay? Which is logical, right? I mean, on, on an Android device, Politically, it, it should broadcast as an Eddy Stone. Now, what I have here is that I have uh, two physical beacons, one virtual beacon. One of the two physical be beacons that I have is configured as an iBeacon. One is Eddy Stone. One is uh, Eddy Stone URL. We'll talk about these two uh, in a moment. Okay, so let me see whether I can show you a demo. So this is my application. So um, when, when I first run this, I say that exited region. I'm not in, inside the region. Um, OK, let me just run this one more time. OK, not in region. And I'm going to connect my beacon. OK, keep your fingers crossed, because um, anything can happen during demonstrations. So let me put in my battery. Oh, OK. OK. So it tells me that I have entered region. And then it will print out what is the UUID, uh, what is the major, minor, what's the accuracy, what's the distance, what's the receive signal strength indicator. And as I take my beacon and move it further away, you will see that the values will change. And then when I remove my battery, okay, it will start up updating because it could not range for beacons anymore. So let's wait a, a second. Okay. So no, no more beacons. And it will take up to 30 seconds to tell you that you have exited the region. Uh, this is one of the API's uh, restrictions. So they will wait for about 30 seconds to tell you that you have exited the region. OK, so OK, exited region. And I'm going to switch my application to the background. OK, so the background. And I'm going to put my battery back in to simulate that I have exited the region and I'm coming back nearer to the beacon again. So I'm going to put it in. There you go. And my application pushes a notification to tell you, that, hey, you have entered the region, you're monitoring. And then I can touch that, launch that to tell me about the location. Good question. Uh, when you say queue the app, queue by the user or queue by the system? Sure. Uh, interestingly, if you, do, you were to, to double press and then queue this, it will not tell you that you have entered the region. But if you were to leave the application on, running by itself, and then due to a memory pressure, the system queues your, your app, it will continue to run and monitor your region. 
Okay, because according to, to what I read, uh, the philosophy of that is that if the user were to double, double press the home button and kill, they will respect your decision. They say, hey, you have made an explicit decision to kill that, that means that you don't want to monitor your region anymore. Okay, so, so that's what I, what I realized. Okay, so I, I have a similar application uh, developed using um, Android, but it's not easy for me to project this up. So I actually had a uh, small little video. So this is what I, I, I did at home. So this is iPhone, this is Android. I have my beacons configured. So same goes for the um, Android. For the Android, I'm using the SD mode SDK. So I got multiple, I got two iBeacons. So both the iPhone and Android is able to detect these two beacons. And I'm going to remove the battery. So OK, I, I think we should continue. So just trust me, it works. <laughs> OK, next, let's talk about uh, Google's Eddy Stone. Now, uh, remember I asked you that question, why, why do they call this Eddy Stone? Uh, basically, it's named after this lighthouse in the UK uh, called Eddy Stone. So um, Eddy Stone is a Bluetooth 4.0 open source uh, communication protocol designed by Apple. It's very similar to, to iBeacon. So, and the good news is that it is officially supported on both the iOS and Android, meaning your, your iOS app and Android can actually detect Eddy Stone beacons as well. Now, the only key difference, the key difference is that uh, Eddy Stones are actually much more feature rich as compared to iBeacons. Uh, iBeacons basically transmits proximity UID, major, minor, nothing else. For Google's Eddy Stone, it supports the following types of uh, data types. So you have what we call UID, we'll talk about it in, in, in a moment, uh, URL as well as TLM. So first format. So Eddy Stones can actually uh, transmit this kind of information known as the Eddy Stone UID. So it basically transmits 16 bytes, namespace followed by instance. So your namespace is pretty similar to your proximity UUID. So basically, it's a string of, of uh, hexadecimal numbers. And they, they basically say that, OK, you, 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 should, you are recommended to use the first 10 bytes of the SHA1 hash of your domain name for your namespace if you want to create a namespace for your beacon. And you have an instance, very similar to my major and minor. And so this. Two blocks of information is being transmitted by uh, Edison beacons. So this is for UID. You can also configure your beacon to transmit Edison URL. Now this is very useful. So you can actually transmit a, a, a URL. And so what happens is that this beacon keeps on transmitting the URL that you have configured. Now something interesting, um, on the estimate beacons, there is a constraint. Your URL cannot exceed 23 bytes, which is quite a small uh, number of characters. So, so what normally people do is that they, they use the URL shortening service, uh, shorten your URL so that your URL is as short as possible. And, and this ties in very nicely with the concept of physical web. How many of you are actually familiar with physical web? Physical web. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, do, are, are you Chrome users? So if you have Chrome on your, on your, on your mobile phone, uh, if on, on the iPhone, if you add the Chrome application to your today screen, anytime you are near a Edison beacon, they will tell you that, hey, we have detected a, a beacon. And this beacon has got the following URL. So you can tap on that, that URL to launch your web browser. So it is supported on Chrome, on iOS, as well as Android. On Android, it's even simpler. So it will have a notification at the top of your, of your device. Drag it down. You'll be able to see the URL that you have detected. Yeah. You need to 
uh, you are talking about the Chrome on, on, you need to go to your settings and you need to go to privacy and you need to turn on this option called, I think, I, if I remember the name correctly, it's physical web. Go to settings, go to privacy, and then there's one setting that you'll be able to see, make sure you turn it on. Okay, so um, if you want to try, I have a, a beacon that is configured, so let me plug in the power, and then uh, go to your device, see whether you can detect my, my URL. The third type is what we call the Eddystone TLM. So it's designed to be broadcast by beacon alongside the data packets. So the telemetry packet contains uh, consists of things like battery voltages, uh, your, your temperature, the number of packets uh, that you have sent since the last time you were power up, or beacon uptime. This is very good for maintenance purposes. Now, how do you actually create Eddystone beacons for development purposes? If you have an Android device, again, download and install the Estimode app, turn on the beacon option, and it broadcasts as an Eddystone URL beacon. Or you can buy the uh, Arduino 101, write a script. That, that if you Google for that, there is an application that somebody has written to, to broadcast that Arduino as an Eddystone beacon. Or you can, again, buy the beacons from some vendors. So how do you actually scan for Eddystone beacons uh, on your devices? You can use the following apps. And let's talk about programming, Eddystone programming in iOS. Now, there are many ways to scan for um, Eddystone beacons in iOS. For those of you who are familiar with the core Bluetooth APIs, uh, how many of you are actually familiar with the core Bluetooth APIs in iOS? So, so the core Bluetooth APIs is basically the set of APIs that allows you to do Bluetooth low energy programming in, in, in iOS. So if you're familiar with that, you can use that to scan for Eddystone beacons, but it's easier to use the vendor's uh, SDKs. So Estimode SDK is one, one of them. The only downside is that at this moment, um, the Estimode SDK is not able to scan in the background, meaning your application must be in the foreground. So according to what I read, they are still trying to figure out how to make things work in the background. Now for Android, you can use uh, the nearby messages API, or again, you can use one of the vendor's uh, SDKs. So, let me show you a demo. So, I have these two beacons. One is configured, configured as a UID. One is configured as a URL. So, let me bring you back. This is my application. Oops. Okay, so... Okay, let me just run this. <clears throat> okay, never mind. Um, bad things always happen during demo, right? So. Okay, so this is how, how it looks like. So I'm able to detect for Eddystone URL beacon. So again, same thing goes for the Android. And then I have one more beacon. And I'm able to detect that as a Eddystone UID. Same goes for the uh, Android device. Okay. Okay, I think that's about it. Uh... Okay, any question? Yes. Yeah, for RFID, I, I think it all depends on the, the, the power. RFID is one possible solution, but, but the thing about beacon is that you just need to buy the beacon. Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure about the RFID, 
that you are talking about, but as far as beacon is, is concerned, you just need to buy the beacons, put in the battery, and then turn it on, and then it will keep on transmitting. And, and the, the, the main logic is actually on the client side. Once you have detected that you are near a beacon, you can actually do whatever you want based on the information of the beacon that you have um, actually collected. Things like your proximity UID, your major, minor, and in most scenarios, once you get the information, you'll make a connection back to your server, and your server will return you specific information about that beacon. Maybe there is a discount for, for items in this department, for example. Yes, so this is specific to each application. So each application would be written to scan for specific beacons that they would be interested, that they are interested in. Uh, in, in most scenarios, you need to run that application at least once. Once you have downloaded, I run my application once, so it will start to monitor that. And then once you are done with that, if you do not physically remove that application, or, or, or kill the application, you just press the home button, switch to another application, your application would be able to continue running in the background, scanning for the beacons that is of interest to you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As long as you do not physically double press the home button, kill the app. So even if you reboot that, that's a good question, if you reboot that, it will still continue to monitor for the beacons. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, great session. And by the way, the speaker gift is a beacon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.